Greetings class and welcome to week 9 lecture 2 the presidency of John Adams. The presidency of John Adams who succeeded George Washington made a conscious effort to respect the precedents set by Washington and largely succeeded. His administration was largely free of scandal but it required all of Adams skill to follow the advice Washington had given in his farewell address to avoid becoming entangled in alliances that could drag the US into foreign wars in which it had little or no real interests at stake. This was due to the ongoing war between Britain and France that had started during Washington's term in which most of the countries of Europe had declared war on France after the French Revolution had led to the bloody execution of most of the French nobility on the guillotines of the revolutionaries during the reign of terror. Likewise, Washington's intense dislike and distrust of political parties, or factions as he had called them in his farewell, had not stopped them from forming during his administration. These factions were the Federalists, who were cemented together by a common support of Alexander Hamilton's concepts of a strong central government, and the Democratic Republicans, who favored the decentralized, weak central government concepts favored by Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. Washington, despite his affinity for many of Hamilton's ideas, nonetheless never formally joined a party. This makes John Adams the first and only candidate for president ever elected by the Federalist Party. Of course, despite the lack of any mention of political parties in the Constitution and Washington's antipathy towards them, political parties have been a feature of the American system ever since. Unlike Washington, Adams was never a slave owner and considered slavery immoral. However, his disapproval was nuanced. While disapproving of slavery, Adams also opposed radical abolitionism, believing it would tear the Union apart. Rather, he favored what he called a, quote, gradual, cautious, and circumspect, end quote, approach, believing that slavery would naturally disappear over time without the chaos and disruption that would erupt if it were ended suddenly. Curiously, Adams wrote, radical, violent abolition would produce, quote, even greater evils, end quote, than the continuation of slavery. He wrongly argued that slavery was already disappearing, while in fact the number of slaves in the United States grew from 700,000 to 900,000 during Adams's term in office. He also argued that slavery was only one of a range of social evils that needed to be addressed. These other evils included lessening religious devotion, lack of education and regard for government, and pleasure-seeking, what he called general debauchery and dissipation. He also argued that many poor whites, especially in Virginia, lived under conditions as bad or worse than slaves. How many of these arguments were sincere, and how many were self-serving justifications for not acting decisively against an institution? in an institution he believed was cruel and immoral cannot be known with certainty. At the same time, he also wrote, the revolution would never be complete until the slaves were free. Foreign affairs dominated much of Adams' presidency. His diplomats had rapidly negotiated the Treaty of Tripoli after his inauguration, a peace treaty with the Barbary pirates of modern-day Libya, which had opened the eastern Mediterranean to American trade. This treaty had declared that there was no reason for hostility between the Muslims of Barbary and the U.S., as the U.S. had no state religion, and thus no grounds for hostility towards Barbary on religious grounds. While the Senate had rapidly ratified this treaty unanimously, the war in Europe was a far more difficult problem. The Hamiltonian Federalists largely favored Britain, while the Jeffersonian Democratic Republicans favored France. In fact, While he was ambassador to revolutionary France, Thomas Jefferson had consulted with the young French nobleman and revolutionary war hero, the Marquis de Lafayette, and his co-author on the text of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, one of the most famous and influential of all the documents that had promoted the revolution in France. In addition, France's intervention had been critical to the success of the American Revolution, and the U.S. and France had maintained close ties since. However, after the French Revolution, the Americans had stopped paying back the debt owed to France on the grounds that its debt had been owed to a previous regime that no longer existed. 
Also, the states had a strong British heritage and maintained close financial, cultural, and commercial links with Great Britain. Adams continued Washington's policy of neutrality in the conflict. In fact, continuity with Washington's administration and policies was a strong underlying theme in Adams's entire presidency to the extent that he carried over many of Washington's cabinet officers, believing that this would ease the tension of transition to a new administration. This was risky. Washington's cabinet had been mostly, mostly selected either by or with the approval of Alexander Hamilton, and many owed more loyalty to Hamilton than they did to the new president, which at times led to outright hostility. As Thomas Jefferson said in a letter, the Hamiltonians by whom Adams is surrounded are only a little less hostile to him than they are to me. Adams, in response, routinely dismissed Hamilton's advice and recommendations. The first major incident that threatened American neutrality in the conflict between Britain and France came to be known as the XYZ Affair. This began shortly after Adams took office, when he dispatched three diplomats to France to ask France for compensation for ships that France had seized after the U.S. had signed the Jay Treaty with Great Britain during the Washington administration and after the U.S. had stopped paying its revolutionary war debts to France. After being made to wait for days, the diplomats were given a short, perfunctory meeting that achieved nothing. After the meeting, the American diplomats were informed by three French agents, nicknamed X, Y, and Z, that no further negotiations would take place unless the Americans paid a large sub sum of money, a bribe, to both the French foreign minister and the Republic of France. The Americans declined to pay and returned home. A few months later, when Adams revealed the incident, it sparked American anger at France, but also led to suspicion by Jeffersonians in Congress that Adams was trying to sabotage good relations with France in order to form an alliance with Britain, and that Adams was acting out of fear of the kind of French radicalism that had led to the 1793-1794 reign of terror in France, which had seen the beheading of most of France's elite, including the king and queen. This hostility on both sides eventually led to military action, although never an outright declaration of war. This conflict is thus known as the Quasi-War, which was fought mostly at sea. As the U.S. was unprepared for a naval conflict with a major European power, Adams pushed several bills through Congress increasing military spending. Adams expanded the U.S. Army, reestablished the U.S. Navy, and founded the U.S. Marine Corps. For this reason, some historians consider Adams the father of the U.S. Navy. The fighting capability of this new Navy was an unexpected and unwelcome surprise to the French. For this reason, along with stresses on the French government resulting from the ongoing war in Europe, France offered to open negotiations with the U.S. Rejecting the advice of pro-British war hawks in his own Federalist Party, Adams opened negotiations with France, which ultimately led to the Convention of 1800. Although the Americans did not call it a treaty, the convention ended the Quasi-War. It confirmed American neutrality, ended French attacks on American ships, and formally ended the Revolution-era Treaty of Alliance between France and the U.S., and repudiated the American debt to France, while also forcing the U.S. to compensate its own citizens for the lost shipping that had led to the XYZ affair. In addition to ending the Quasi-War, the convention had another important effect not appreciated at the time of its signing. By establishing peace between France and the U.S., it laid a foundation that would make possible the diplomacy that led, three years later, to the U.S. purchase of French Louisiana, a huge tract of land which extended all the way to the Rocky Mountains and the Canadian border from the Mississippi River, and nearly doubled the size of the territory under control of the United States. Adams also made several unpopular decisions in conducting his domestic policy. As the Quasi-War heated up, Adams and his Federalists faced withering criticism from Jefferson's Democratic Republicans and from newspapers sympathetic to the Jeffersonian view. In response, the Federalist-controlled Congress passed and Adams signed 
a series of controversial laws known as the Alien and Sedition Acts. These were four laws that targeted Adams' political opposition and taken together comprise one of the most controversial legal acts of the early American Republic. The four were the Naturalization Act, which changed the residency requirements for citizenship from 5 to 14 years, as most immigrants, being workers, farmers, or poor, supported Jefferson's Democratic Republicans. Second, the Alien Friends Act empowered the president to imprison or deport any resident alien deemed dangerous, while the Alien Enemies Act enabled the president to imprison or deport any male citizen of a hostile foreign country over the age of 14 during wartime. Finally, the Sedition Act criminalized criticism of the president or the U.S. government. The Sedition Act was used to prosecute a large number of anti-federalist newspaper publishers and even congressmen sympathetic to Jefferson. These acts were controversial even at the time. They were bitterly debated and became an issue during the election of 1800. The Alien and Sedition Acts also produced another extremely divisive reaction. The Kentucky and Virginia Resolutions, written by Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, which denounced the Alien and Sedition Acts as unconstitutional and claimed a state's right to nullify federal laws that the state believed were unconstitutional. This is clearly contrary to the Supremacy Clause of the U.S. Constitution and created a long-term conflict that became a central argument for Southern secessionists in the years and events that led to the American Civil War. In fact, it was the so-called nullification crisis of the 1830s that had led President Andrew Jackson to threaten to hang John C. Calhoun of South Carolina when Calhoun tried to invoke this claim of a state's right to nullify federal law. The Naturalization Act, Alien Friends Act, and Sedition Act would all be repealed during the administration of Jefferson after he had defeated Adams in 1800 but the Alien Enemies Act re remains on the law books to this day. In order to pay for his military buildup, Adams had been forced to resort to another unpopular measure, raising taxes. This was the direct tax of 1798, a tax on real estate and slaves. In response, an auctioneer in Pennsylvania, where there were few slaves, named John Fries, began speaking out against the tax leading protests, intimidating and threatening tax collectors, and generally fomenting a rebellion. This rebell rebellion spread, and an armed group of rebels eventually marched on a jail, freeing several tax protesters that had been arrested. Faced with an armed uprising and acts of intimidation against federal marshals, Adams called out the militia, following the early examples set in Shays' Rebellion and the Whiskey Rebellion. The militia marched in and arrested many of the rebels, including Fries. While Federalists demanded that Fries be hanged, Adams refused and again following Washington's example pardoned the rebels and issued a general amnesty for everyone involved. He also sus suspected that the rebels had been deliberately provoked by members of the Democratic-Republican Party as part of the ongoing partisan conflict between the political parties. While the rebellion was crushed without bloodshed, Adams was widely perceived as having overreacted, and the rebellion ultimately saw the mass repudiation of the Federalist Party by Pennsylvania, German, and Dutch immigrants, from whom most of the rebels were related, and their turn to the Democratic Republicans of Thomas Jefferson led them to play an instrumental role in Jefferson's defeat of Adams in the election of 1800. The election of 1800 was a defining moment in the history of the early American Republic. It was the first election in American history to be thrown into the House of Representatives, and, as some historians argue, the appearance of regional voting blocs, negotiation for electoral votes, and character assassination smear campaigns make it the first truly modern election. The victory of Jefferson and his Democratic Republicans marked a sudden and drastic shift from the federalism of Adams and Washington. For this reason, the election of 1800 is often referred to as the Revolution of 1800.